So as promised, you got um, longer and fuller uh, accounts of some of the um, some of the syntactic principles, especially and and word order um, stuff that we that we got the kind of simplified or a somewhat simplified version of um, in Baker um, last time. Um, I'm going to hit my own, what I consider the kind of high points of um, Mitchell and Robinson's account of um, syntax through the pages um, uh, that we read for today. Um, and, uh, but, I, but I'm happy to take uh, questions you know, sort of um, throughout. Um, so starting really with um, one thing I will say at the top of page 63, because I had to look this up, <laughs> um, it, the use of a single verb form where modern English would use a resolved tense or mood. Um, so a, a, a resolved tense um, simply means um, one where you use a form of the verb to be. Um, uh, at least in this case. So is going or was going. Um, uh, I think I mentioned before, like the, um, for our phrase, in, in modern English, we would say, we would tend to say, like, the sun is shining, right? Um, old English would, much, would be much likelier to simply to use um, the conjugated form of that verb, um, say, as soon as um, sheeneth, um, shineth, right, in its cognate. Um, rather than is shinende, um, which it could theoretically say, um, but it would sound quite unidiomatic um, in Old English. Um, so in terms of uh, their, uh, Mitchell and Robinson's, that is, um, account of word order, which starts on um, page 63, um, I want to highlight that uh, paragraph 145 um, on the next page, on page 64, um, this S dot 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 V um, word order is most common in subordinate clauses. Um, we got, I, I kind of previewed and we talked a little bit about that last time, um, that when you're dealing with a subordinate, uh, a complex sentence in Old English, that is to say one with a main clause and, and one or more subordinate clauses, be very much on the lookout for the verb to come at the end of that subordinate clause. Um, this can be tricky, especially if you're dealing with the past tense of a strong verb that may not have an ending. Um, so make sure that you're, um, when you're looking for the verbs, um, that you're looking at the end of the, at the, end of the clause um, in particular. Um, and then the next bit that I wanted to note, uh, the top of page 65, um, another, a, a context in which you get the verb subject, what they're calling the verb subject word order, um, is in principal clauses introduced by certain adverbs. So they give the example, then came the dawn, um, which sounds sort of arch archaic, poetic, whatever you want to call it, um, in Old English it would not sound, it would just sound totally normal. Um, and we've seen gazillions of examples, I think, already in our, in our relatively brief time reading of tha, verb, <laughs> subject, right? Um, and we're going to see um, still more. This, um, this is not an absolute rule um, as the, as paragraph 147 um, Go explains in some detail. Um, so there's a they they write at the sort of two thirds, maybe three fourths of the way down that long paragraph. They write that the old preference for vs, that is to say, verb subject word order after an adverb, um, as in modern German, is at times conquered by the new preference, that is to say, new in Old English. Um, for a subject verb word order. So it's not a hard and fast rule, as at least in my memory of studying German, it is um, that the verb has to be um, the verb has to be second. Um, but it is a it is a strong it is still a strong preference. Um, all right. Any questions about their account of their their more their more detailed account of um, word order? I 
I think Mitchell and Robinson do quite a nice um, job of explaining uh, both recapitulation and anticipation. We saw examples of, um, of anticipation um, last time. Recapitulation is sort of the, the flip side of that, um, right? And I, li I like their, um, <laughs> I like their, their, their comparison of this to a, a modern politician who has the desire but not the ability to be an orator. Um, and they call it the device of pausing in mid-sentence and starting afresh with a pronoun or some group of words which sums up what has gone before. Um, so they give the simple example from Alfred's um, preface to the translation of, of uh, the pastoral cure, cura pastor, pastoralis. Alfred writes, um, Ura ildron, thathas stoa ar hildon, um, our ancestors who previously occupied these places. So he's got uh, a relatively long, and it's not even that long, but um, he's got a subject and then a dependent clause, right? So our ancestors who previously occupied these places, thathas stoa ar hildon, um, and then he sort of as Mitchell and Robinson say, pauses as it were for thought, and then goes on, here, luvodon wisdom. Um, so that here might look like, and indeed it could be, um, an object, but in this case, it's a recapitulative um, nominative that looks back to um, the, uh, the subject or a drawn. Um, and that ambiguity gets resolved by the fact that wisdom, um, which is the the actual direct object, um, there's sort of nothing for wisdom to do there um, if it's not the direct object. And in fact, Luvadon um, has a plural uh, verb ending. So we know that um, that hia has to be the subject. Um, this is not wildly common, the recapitulation. It's certainly less common than anticipation. Um, but it is something uh, to be aware of because it, it sounds yeah, it's, I mean, as Mitchell and Robinson say, it, it, sound, it looks like the kind of thing, it feels like the kind of thing that happens from oral delivery when you're sort of not sure how the sentence is going to end and you get partway through and you're like, oh, God, what was I doing? Um, and yet here in Old English, we often see it in, in written sources when presumably they had time to go back and edit, but for whatever reason, um, didn't feel that it was necessary to do so. Um, Anticipation, um, so if you take a look at the second paragraph in, uh, in section or, sig I mean, I think that's, uh, well, whatever that sigil is, um, in 148 on page uh, 66, the common use of a pronoun to anticipate a noun clause may be compared with that uh, or with this. So the simple example that they give um, is, thought that often my um, arrest on funda that's a Earl Nolde Urtho Yetholion. So literally they write, or they translate, when the kinsman of Offa, Ofan, Mai, um, first learned that thing, so Arist on Funda that, the that, the first of that, namely that, <laughs> the second that, the leader would not tolerate cowardice. Literally, um, the 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 noble, the, the Earl. Um, the noble did not desire to um, suffer um, cowardice. Um, those two that's um, are a very good example of, um, of anticipation. So when you see that, that first that, <laughs> um, you have to basically keep your mind flexible and say, all right, I don't quite know what this that is doing there. Keep reading. And then when you see um, the verb on funda, which is going to require a direct object. And in this case, the direct object is going to be a noun clause, right? He found out. He found something out. What did he find out? He found out that. It's sort of um, that discovery <laughs> that on funde is going to be um, a, is a, is a transitive verb that needs a direct object and that the direct object is going to be a clause. That's what um, kind of retroactively, as it were, uh, clarifies that the first that is anticipation. Um, so as I said last time, you don't have to translate that first that. 
Um, you just have to be able to parse it correctly and understand what it's doing. Um, any questions on um, any questions on that? Hit as a is as a is a is a perfectly viable, although less common, alternative um, to fat as a um, as a as an uh, anticipatory pronoun. Um, the other thing to be aware of is, however, like even though that and hit are by far the most common because they are the you know they're the accusative. Um, when you have verbs and which Old English has quite a number of, as we've discussed, when you have verbs that take a different case from the accusative, you will see the anticipatory pronoun um, or, or demonstrative um, in whatever the case is of that, um, of that, ver uh, that, that verb takes. Um, so for example, wane on, um, the verb to, uh, to believe, which takes the genitive, um, what would the what form would would that that take instead? Fast, exactly. Very good. Yeah. All right. Any questions on um, on anticipation? So the splitting of heavy groups on page 67, um, paragraph or section 149, um, this is an example. This is basically uh, the splitting of compounds, um, compound subjects and compound objects that we talked about um, last time. Um, so you can ha they just go into more, um, they just go into more detail. Um, and I don't think there's anything substantively different that we need to dwell on. If I'm wrong, let me know. Um, and then next, on page 68, we have correlation. Um, again, this is mostly review um, of, of things that we talked about last time. Um, I would highlight the bottom of page 68 in um, section 151. Um, the, they note that. Word order, this is really just recapitulating. Huh, see what I did there? Uh, recapitulating stuff that we saw in Baker. Word order is an even more useful and reliable guide than context, for it may be taken as a pretty safe rule for prose that when one of two correlative thaw clauses has the word order verb subject, it's the principal clause and thaw must mean then. The temporal clause introduced by tha, and really that's the subordinate clause, introduced by tha when may have the, sub, the word order s dot 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 v or simply sv. Um, so in that case, we see that the subordinate clause most commonly, I would say, does have that s dot 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 v where the, um, the inflected form of the verb in the subordinate clause gets kind of shunted to the end of the clause. Um, as, we've, as we've discussed earlier. Um, but again, not a hard and fast rule. Um, and this is true, even though they give the, they specify that this is in the case of specifically with thaw, it's equally the case um, as they go on to clarify um, with thonna, thonna, thar, thar, um, thidder, thidder, and thaw, thaw um, in section 152. Um, Any questions on that? So noun clauses on page 70, this is where um, we most typically get uh, instances of anticipation with that or hit. Um, and they refer you back to paragraph 148 um, for, all of, for all of that. Um, they, Mostly, my, my reading of these pages is really that they're mostly concerned with um, assuaging our fears <laughs> about um, the indicative versus the subjunctive. Um, so the upshot of all of this, there's a lot of um, detail and a lot of, and many examples on pages 71 and the top of 72. I would say that the upshot takes place um, in the second full paragraph of page 72, 
We may say that while the rules set out above often works, fluctuation between the subjunctive and the indicative in Old English noun clauses is often of little significance. So what this means for you practically is you really don't need to worry about um, translating, about how you translate um, the, uh, how you translate those, um, that mood, um, whether it's indicative or subjunctive. Simply, simply use whichever seems most um, idiomatic um, or, more, or most natural in modern English. Um, and if, if, if I want to test you on what the, what the ending is, I'll ask specifically, I won't like, I won't, I won't be judging you based on, the, on your translation of an ambiguous um, indicative or, or um, subjunctive, okay? Um, the next bit that is um, actually quite interesting because they, um, because Mitchell and Robinson sort of read the same text differently in two different places in their book um, comes in paragraph or, or section 159 on page 73. Um, they get very exercised, and in my, in my understanding, not, I, well, I don't entirely understand why they get so exercised um, about the question of whether um, an interrogative uh, pronoun can whether you can subst whether you can use interrogative words also as relative pronouns in Old English. Um, as we talked about last time, Modern English finds this completely normal, um, right? We say, who is there, who being interrogative, and also, I know who is there, where who um, is a relative pronoun. Um, for, my, for my money, Old English actually does this quite a lot as well. And we see one example um, in a very cool phrase uh, from The Wanderer. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, the, the quoted bit in 159. Um, On each hand, thonan wood winter charig over wathama yebind sochte sela drerig cinches brutan huar ich fair o thanach findan machte thonatha in Madu hala mina wissa. Um, so the main verb here is, if I can find the chalk, there's profusion, but so the main verb here is sochte. By the way, notice where where is the itch? Notice how far how far that initial itch is separated from its verb. You have itch, heon thonan, wood, winter chereg, over wathama yabint. You have to wait all the way past that, almost a line and a half, to get to um, the, the main verb. So they are saying that this is a main verb that has as objects both a noun and a clause containing a dependent question. Um, and what they mean by that here is that sochte has one object, one direct object, which is just the noun hall. I sought a hall. Um, and then the second direct object is that whole clause ah. I sought a hall, and I also. <laughs> although that's all implied, there's no and I also. I sought a hall, dot, 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 sought where I, i.e. looked for the place where I, far or near, might find um, uh, one who in the Mead Hall might know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now what's interesting about this, is take a look at note one at the bottom of the page. The first object of Sochte um, is Sinchus Britan in our text, where the attractive compound celedrerig, sad for a hall, is accepted. Um, so basically what they're saying here is that in one, if you flip to, let's see, page, 
Yeah, on page 279, where you actually have um, the text of the wanderer um, in, uh, in Old English, they print these lines, 23 through 27. Yeah. They they print them completely different. Well, completely differently. They um, they pull together celadrerig um, into a single compound. So this is a good example of how ambiguous um, Old English poetry can be. The very same editors, <laughs> in the very same edition of their own textbook, are in one case reading Sela as the accusative object, or as one of the accusative objects, one accusative object of the verb sochta. And in the second, where it's um, uh, celadrerig, um, here, cella becomes part of a compound that's modifying the speaker of the sentence. And they read. Uh, Britain, Sinchus Britain, um, a dispenser of um, treasure as the object. Of course, you can do that because the, the, the weak noun ending of Britain is so ambiguous. It could be, um, it could be the, it could be accusative. So it could be, I, dreary for a hall, i.e., you know, really in search of a hall, um, sought a dispenser of treasure. Or it could be, as in, the first, as in on page 73, I sought sad, meaning, you know, so dreary, dreary is going to become modern English dreary, um, but it really, it really means sad in Old English. Um, I sought the hall of a dispenser of treasure. So in, on page 73, Britain has to be genitive. And as they're construing it on page 279 in the actual text, um, it's accusative. Um, so this is a great example of, and, and honestly, both are possible. Um, so it's a great example of how the ambiguity of endings in Old English creates ambiguity in the literature itself. Um, so the, the grammatical sort of characteristics or texture of the language inflect, <laughs> literally and metaphorically, um, the sort of poetic potential of the language. Um, and you can see, um, if, you, if you have your, the whole text and you, and you can turn to page um, 279, you can see uh, the facsimile of the opening page of The Wanderer from the Exeter book. Um, and you'll, you'll, you can see how different um, the, uh, the script looks and how in Old English there is actually quite a bit of, um, of word separation. Um, but they don't, they don't give us, they don't take us all the way down. Oh, yeah. So if you take a look at, um, it's a little, it's sort of opposite line. It's about opposite line 26 and 27. Um, if you look at the left-hand side, you can see a long S. It sort of looks like, uh, Sochte. And then I see, a word, I see a pretty clear word separation between Sela and Dreerig um, right after that. Um, so I think the scribe, at least, seems to have construed it as, um, as this option. If you look up above, though, like in the first couple lines where it's like really clear, there's also word separation like, like between all sorts of other things. Yes. Which like, presumably are being interpreted as compounds by M and R. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So, like, so, love, like every everyone that looks like to me a compound word is has word separation in the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a, it's a very good point, and it's 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 quite un. Um, so you're right. It's quite unreliable, and even into the Middle English period, one often has um, noticeable quote unquote word separation between um, even prefixes of verbs. Um, so they're, they're, all of these scribes are, seem to be sort of figuring out, making it up as they go along um, in many cases. Um, so, so you're quite right, Alyssa, that the, um, the fact that there looks like 
that there is some kind of separation between Sela and Dreyrig does not necessarily mean um, that it, it has to be construed that way. So. The way they write W's is so cursed. They look, they look like P's. I, yes. Like a lot of the variations in here I've seen before, like long S's. Yeah. Their R's are a little, little jank. So yeah. That. Yeah. Oh, the P and W. I, I don't know. I don't know how to deal with that. So that's the that's the yeah the old English W's. It's super interesting. So that's the win. Um, that's um, that's the win. And for whatever reason, um, we haven't. So take a look at. Which is the easiest way to find? Well, where do you see that? Swat in the fourth line. Inside the Yes, good. Um, so excellent. Uh, swa and then quath. You can see that nice C win, um, and then the A E ligature for the ash, and then the ev. Oh, by the way, I think I've been using ev and thorn interchangeably, um, and haven't maybe ever actually given the f the full explanation. Um, so ev and thorn, thorn, ev. Um, these are absolutely interchangeable in Old English. Um, they ha there's no difference in pronunciation or meaning or anything like that. Um, so thorn. God, I can't even write today. And ev. Um, in Old Norse and modern Icelandic, this is the unvoiced and this is the voiced. Um, so th versus th. Um, but there's no difference in, in, in Old English. Um, to your point, Alyssa, about the weirdness of the, of the win, I think that the reason that we haven't, that, that everybody, for what, everybody uh, transliterates the win to W is because the win and the thorn look so similar um, in, in, in Old English. Like if you can see, I mean, there is a difference. So the thorn, um, take a look at line five. Um, Rothra, you can see there's a win R kind of blurring into the A, and then the thorn, there's a no, there's a marked ascender above above the line. So that that's the difference between the win and the thorn is that the win kind of looks like a thorn if you got rid of the of the top ascender. Um, Wait, so then how would you like write a P? Or like in this in this specific script. That's a great question. P is quite an unusual letter in Old English. Um, so uh, yeah. So we saw it in Pleolich. Um, the the Alfrich thinks it's very Pleolich uh, or dangerous to translate Genesis. Um, let me if you can find a P real quick. Right after swa swa kwe yad stapa. Yes. It's a marked serif. Yeah, it looks like a little bit of a serif. So they've 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 accentuated um, this. So there's a p, and then a win is more like a. Also, in many scripts, the the um, the, the chamber of the win is quite a lot bigger than the chamber of the p. I can't. This this scribe doesn't seem to observe that, unfortunately. But um, but yeah, it's a great question. I think the short answer, probably Tara, is. Um, uh, context. I mean, if uh, the, you know, a P, as so often is the case in Old English, have you gotten used to this yet? Um, how do you tell the difference between X and Y? Context. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, where's the, like, line? Uh, right. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. This was all a very entertaining digression from um, the bottom of page 73. No, it's good. I mean, there isn't actually a lot of grammar to get through today, so this is this is perfect. And now it's up on the now it'll be up on the interwebs for um, for those who had to miss today. Um, let's take a look at the top of page 74. Um, so this is, um, you know, I, they're they're. They say, Hwilchna is strictly an interrogative introducing a noun clause, and the literal sense is, et cetera, et cetera. It is easy to see how such a ju juxtaposition of noun and interrogative would lead to the use of the interrogative as a relative, but this stage has not been, has not been reached in Old English. Um, for our purposes, you don't need to worry about this. Like, you, you just translate it as it's written, and you'll be, and you'll be fine, OK? Uh, well, not as it's written in the sort of word-for-word -word sense, but just translate the words in the word order that they have to be. Um, 
All right, and that's actually, oh no, there's one, little, one more little bit on page um, 75, the accusative and the, and the infinitive. Um, we've talked about this as well, um, the fact that um, Old English, because it doesn't have an inf uh, a, a passive infinitive form, um, often uses, um, well, I shouldn't say often, can use um, the infinitive as a sort of um, implied uh, passive infinitive, um, as Mitchell and Robinson note toward the bottom of uh, section 161. Any questions on that? All right, I think that's all of the grammar that you had to uh, go through for today. So it's a, it's a quick day for, uh, for our recording friend. Thank you very much.